الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي تقدس عن الأشباه ذاته وتنزه عن مشابهة الأمثال صفاته يا من دلت على وحدانيته آياته وشهدت بربوبيته مسموعته واحد لا من قلة وموجود لا من علة الذي هو بالبر معروف وبالإحسان موصوف معروف بلا غاية وموصوف بلا نهاية أول قديم بلا ابتداء وآخر كريم بلا انتهاء الذي غفر ذنوب المذنبين كرما وحلما يا من ليس كمثله شيء وهو السميع البصير واشهد بأننا نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا سندنا مولانا مرشدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه وأولياء أمته وأمته الأجمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقال الله عز وجل في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تتغلوا قوما غزب الله عليهم قد يأسوا من الآخرة كما يأس الكفار من أصحاب القبور صدق الله مولانا العظيم وقال جل جلاله وعم نواله في شان حبيبه مخبرا وعامرا إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما It is my pleasure and my honor to share these very valuable moments with you in the house of Allah uh, whenever we get any opportunity to remember uh, Allah and his being in his house these are moments of privilege may Allah accept our coming here Amen. and give us ajal in the darain the topic of today uh, is a very central topic uh, uh, to our knowledge and understanding of Islam. But the part of uh, 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 the topic that I have been given is the relation, relationship of parents uh, when they pass away. Of course, before me you've heard a very eloquent lecture uh, which uh, elicits from the Qur'an and the Sunnah the status of parents and I don't really propose to go into any uh, further detail to repeat or to uh, um, reiterate although <laughs> there's no <laughs> end of how much you could reiterate this you could carry on uh, and you could have uh, as many lectures on this same topic it's never enough because it's an essential part of the Quran, fabric of the Quran and Sunnah but I would like to focus on the area that I uh, have been given and may Allah allow us to enhance our understanding of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Um, the basis of my discussion, the foundation of my discussion, starts with something very simple. In the society we live in today, those who govern us, their objective of governance from uh, a... Uh, from a neutral perspective, not from a controversial perspective, from a neutral perspective, the object of governance of any state over its people is one, and that is one word, and that is called regulation. The state is not interested in who you are personally. 
The state isn't interested in what your ability is. The state has certain objectives, and the most supreme objective is to regulate you. As long as you stand on the red, red traffic light, as long as you pay your taxes, as long as you pay your dues, pay your bills, the state is fine with you, you are state of the fine yeah, with, the, with the state. But governance in the Quran and Sunnah is not limited to regulation. Because as far as the modern state is concerned, in the four walls of your home, you could behave like an animal. It doesn't really matter. As long as no one is affected by your conduct. If you read the writings of the uh, uh, the, the thinkers of liberty and the system of liberty that, under which we live today. If you look at the who thought of this 70, 100, 150, 200 years ago, and you see what they were aiming at, the object of the state is just to simply regulate. As long as your conduct doesn't harm someone else, the state is happy with you. But what you do in your private life has got nothing to do with the state. That is why the modern state is now opening its uh, 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 eyes and saying, well, if freedom means you can do what you like, well, then what's wrong with prostitution? And then what's wrong with uh, homosexuality? Because all these are part of freedoms of the individual. And so therefore, if you can have a relationship, why can't you marry in this context? So the idea of freedom is you can do what you like. There's no limits. As long as, as, long as the, li if the if a limit is placed by science, then yes that would be an acceptable limit. But otherwise, freedom, do what you like. Uh, what we call, used to call morality and immorality is no longer relevant. For us, this is moral. But for the next door neighbor, it doesn't make a difference. He carries on. You have two pieces of meat in front of you. One is halal, one is haram. You present them both to a, a <laughs> kafir. It makes no difference to him. They taste the same. They look the same. They, 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 it's not that by eating haram food you, you, you get disease or you pass away. It's there. It's, so what? You have two couples living next door to each other. One is living 30 years with children. One is living 30 years with children. Um, they both got five children. Uh, one is living with marriage. One is living without marriage. The only thing that divides, uh, separates them is three words. I do, I do, I do. But those three words mean nothing in the society we live anymore. Why? Because for, for us, as Muslims, of course, one is halal, one is halal. But in the real world, it means nothing. So what? You've got five children. He's got five, they've got five children. For all intents and purposes, it's the same. So now the modern state is saying, listen, we don't really care about you. We care about certain rights. We'll give you those rights. As long as you behave yourself, don't bother anyone else. You can do what you like in your own home. But this is what distinguishes uh, the modern state and modern ideologies to Islam. The object of Islam is not simply regulation. Regulation is one of the agenda of uh, Islam. But the real objective of Islam and the ultimate objective, as far as we are concerned from a practical point of view, is our development. The word develop as individuals. Islam wants to develop us into something. What does it want from us? How does it want to develop us? Well, if you look at the Quran and Sunnah, there's two ways of development. Number one, through ilm, knowledge. And number two, through amal, through practice. Acquire more knowledge, the more, the merrier. The more practice you do, so good, alhamdulillah. But one must be very cautious in the day and age we live because we practice religion in a very formal way. We've lost sight of the actual objective of knowledge or the actual objective of practice. It's just a ritual that we perform. A person who has uh, Three degrees is given more preferential treatment over a person who has one degree. Because in the commercial world, three is better than one and he must be more qualified. But how do you know that the person with three degree, degrees or four degrees, including a master's, is less developed as a human being 
Then the one with, um, uh, then the one with uh, uh, a one degree. And nowadays, it's a question of dressing up. This is a joke, if I share a joke, because I can see a lot of your faces are very serious. And I find that very concerning when I see people with so serious faces. Because it's either that they're being told off or either they're petrified. Um, in Egypt, the, the ulama, they wear, uh, you know the caps where they wear, uh, the buggeries they wear? It's not really a buggery of taki, it's just really a taki on a cap. And that's not sunnah, it's just their tradition. So it's fine, no problem. Uh, so one farmer, he was coming from uh, Upper Egypt uh, <laughs> into visiting Cairo, uh, uh, and uh, uh, he was sitting in a train, so he wanted to visit his relatives. In those days, they didn't have suit and tie. Suit and tie only in, is only now recently introduced in the Islamic world, uh, uh, where people feel pride when they wear suit and tie, which is the sign of a gentleman. But in those days, the suit and tie wasn't the, the gentleman's attire. In Egypt, the, the gentleman's attire was the attire of ulama, and therefore the imam and the, and the, and the, and the jubba. So uh, he was sitting on the train, and there was two people talking with each other. They were also farmers. And um, so at the end of the journey, the one farmer said to the other farmer, he said, it's a pleasure to see you. He said, it's a pleasure to see you. He said, I hope we can meet next time. He said, yes, I hope, but how are we going to meet? He said, well, give me your address. He said, okay, but I can't write. So they looked around and they saw this person, he had a pagri on and he had a jubbar. And they went up to him and they said, Sheikh Saab, could you write the address for me? He said, what do you mean? Well, I can't write an address. I can't write. He said, but you got a pagri on. He said, Acha, he put the pagri on his head. He said, go on, so do you write. <laughs> <laughs> By dressing up, you don't. <laughs> become an alim <laughs> by dressing up you don't you know uh, 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 <laughs> it, it's not bad there's no, no, no problem with it <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that nowadays the object of why I told you this joke is nowadays it's just all formality rituals let's just do it for the sake of it people will say oh very big alim people will uh, look at me when I uh, uh, worship and say oh you brought near card me you know just to, to show people but the real objective of ibadat and ilm ultimately is kabuliyat in the, in, the, uh, in the domain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if Allah likes your worship, He can elevate your status above even angels. <laughs> if He likes your worship, He can elevate your status above angels. That's why you've seen in the whole of the Quran and Sunnah, the whole of the Quran and Sunnah, there's not <coughs> one hadith. Not one hadith, even a zaif, even a mawzu hadith, where it is written, a human being served an angel. You'll never find a hadith. But you'll find many hadiths in the Quran and Sunnah, where you'll find angels serving human beings. So Allah, and yet angels are perfect, they are masum uh, uh, <laughs> they are they are absolute perfect icons of perfection but Allah makes them khadim of humans who are imperfect I'm not only talking about prophets I'm talking about humans uh, not non-prophets they are khadim malaika khadim of uh, humans why? what is it? it's because of their qabuliyat the acceptance in Allah's presence and it's all about acceptance it's not about uh, uh, how much you do it's not about quantity um there is a vakya, and I, I, I know my topic, and I'm not going to dig, digress too much. But I, I love to quote this vakya because the Arifin have quoted this vakya, uh, and there's great uh, uh, lessons to be learned from it. There was a person, and this is a hadith, there was a person in Bani Israel, he was renowned to have prayed to Allah for 900 years. How many hundred years? So the first question is, how did he live 900 years? <laughs> Well, the answer to that is those people in those days, they had longer lives to us. They had longer lives than us. So they were able to live longer lives and therefore pray to Allah longer. 900 years he was an alim and he, 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 he divorced himself from society. He went into a, a little cave and he <laughs> worshipped Allah for 900 years. Can you imagine? I mean, with us, we worship Allah for five years and we think, but I need to the <laughs> people say that people say oh, you need to tell me but this person prostrated to Allah 
and did worship for Allah for 900 years. Can you imagine? That's not just an ordinary piece of time. It's a huge time. And after 900 years, Allah specially commissioned a prophet from Bani Sa'id, whoever it was. He commissioned a prophet to go and to speak to that person on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you subhanahu know what the message was? <laughs> you saying subhanAllah, <laughs> you know what the message was? The message was Allah said to his prophet, Oh my Nabi from Banisa, go and tell him I have rejected 900 years of his worship. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you should have saved you, subhanAllah. <laughs> 900 years of worship. Allah said, tell him, oh my Nabi, go and tell him I have rejected his worship. Now if someone told you that you had been praying to Allah, or forget anything else, if someone told you your Hajj had been rejected, how do you feel? Huh? Really bad. But this Prophet told him, 900 years of your worship has been rejected. And you know what this person started doing? He started dancing, he started celebrating. And the Nabi said, <laughs> excuse me, I'm a bit confused here. You're supposed to be sad. Allah has rejected 900 years of your worship. The object of your worship was to uh, 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 be accepted in Allah's presence. He said, no, my object wasn't so that my worship would be objected, uh, accepted. My objective was to communicate with him. After 900 years, at least he sent back a communication. <laughs> <laughs> at least he's acknowledged me that, yes, I know you are here. You are worshipping me. So all I need is my beloved to uh, communicate with me. SubhanAllah, the fact that you pass the message is enough for me. So Qubuliyat, acceptance, doesn't mean acceptance in, 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 uh, in quantity terms. You know, like I did two rakat and I want two rakat reward. It's in terms, the Qubuliyat which the Ahl Sunnah look for, is Qubuliyat in the sense that it pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you ask for Qubuliyat based on his fazal as opposed to his karam, uh, his adal, then of course Allah gives you a status which even angels look at and say, SubhanAllah, Allah gave him such a status. But in uh, the ranks of human beings, the highest rank which is untouchable is the rank of prophets. No one can touch their ranks. After prophets, the highest rank of all human beings, after prophets, from Adam alayhi salam all the way to the day of judgment, the highest rank a human being can attain is the status called Sahabiyat. There is no highest. Uh, you can have all the awliya, all the awliya in the earth that walk this earth, and they cannot compare to the status of one Sahabi. This must be very clearly understood. Why? What did that Sahabi do that gave him such a high status? He simply perceived Rasulullah <laughs> and that is the highest uh, deed, amal, a person could ever do. Why? Because namaz, roza, hajj, zakat, uh, 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 um, there is no guarantee as to what that would lead towards. But the Prophet وسلم, Sahabi, and there is a raid for Sahaba that they would... Anyway, I'm not going to go into this. I just want to come to my topic. The highest status is Sahabiyat. The door of Sahabiyat is closed. No one could reach the state of Sahabiyat. But there was one Sahaba amongst the Sahaba, uh, uh, one Sahabi amongst the Sahaba. He was renowned for his knowledge and he was renowned for his taqwa and wara. He was renowned for his piety. People used to, Sahaba used to look at him and say, wow, wow, you know, what a pious person he is. You know what his name was? His name was Sayyidina al qama what was his name, Sayyidina? Al Qama. Imam Muslim of Imam Muhammad brings this hadith and other Muhaddisim bring this hadith. Hazrat Al Qama was renowned for his ilm and for his taqwa. And there's nothing bigger than ilm and taqwa because these are the bases upon which you develop. Now, he was renowned amongst the Sahaba for his piety and his knowledge. And when uh, someone came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Huzur, al qama is in his last moments, Sakaratul Maut, but death is not coming to him. He is suffering at the hands of uh, death. And you, his, you know, when you reach your final stage of de uh, towards death, um, that final stage is called Sakarat. 
So sakarat can be prolonged, it can be short, depending on Allah's uh, will. But on this occasion, the sakarat of the pain of mort was being prolonged, and Sayyidina Akrama was suffering in death, and no one knew what to do. I mean, there's different ahadis, really, <coughs> or this, that, and the other, fine. But on this occasion, a companion of the Rasul is suffering in death. The message comes to the Prophet and the Prophet visits his companion and sees his state and then says, call his mother. Call his mother. So his mother came and he said to her, he said, you are not happy with your son? You are not happy with your son? She said, no, I'm not happy with him. Then the Prophet ﷺ said to his companions, Oh, companions, bring wood. Let's burn Akrama here now. al -Qama. Let's burn him. You burn a Sahabi of the Prophet ﷺ? This is the hukum of the Prophet ﷺ. Bring wood. Let's burn him. This is a Sahabi who no wali can touch the status of. This is a Sahabi upon whom the Prophet ﷺ and the Quran has done so much wa'id. But the Prophet ﷺ said, bring sticks, let's burn him now here. So when the command came, the mother said, why are you going to bring the sticks? She, he said, well, if he, he displeased you, then his fate is the fire there. So let's start the process here. Where was the... Ibadat of Sayyidina al -Qama. Where was the ilm of Sayyidina al -Qama? His <coughs> death process had been prolonged. His pain had been prolonged because his mother was dissatisfied with him. His status could not uh, 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 affect him. Why? Because it is imperative that our parents are happy with us. And when his mother realized that this is what's going to happen to my son, she put aside her uh, 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 her. Uh, uh, objection to her son and she said I cannot see my flesh and uh, uh, bones uh, 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 suffer in this way she forgave him as soon as she forgave him Sayyidina al qama passed away peacefully Allah. Allah. as soon as she forgave him Sayyidina al qama passed away peace the sakarat of world finished what does that tell you? your ilm is of no consequence <coughs> your amal is of no consequence if your parents if you displease your parents but Displeasure of the parents is not based on whether they are right or whether they are wrong. Some people say, if my parents are wrong, well they're wrong, that's fine. I don't have to now respect them. No. If they are right or if they are wrong, that is not a matter for you. The Quran says, لا تكون لهما أفن ولا تنهرهما When the Quran says, do it, don't think. Okay, let me tell you something. What is the most heinous <coughs> offense a person can commit in Sharia? What is the most heinous offense? The most serious offense in Sharia. What is the most ser serious offence? Shirk. In the shirk la zulmun, azim is the greatest offence. But even if your parents are proponents of shirk, if they are mushrik, you still have a duty to respect them. And that Abu Huraira was very disturbed by his parents. The way they used to torment him and the way they used to antagonize him where, when, about Rasulullah But despite that, the Prophet said, No, they commit the worst of offenses. They may be the worst people on this earth, but you still have a duty to respect them. That is why now, in this society that we live today, people say, yeah, if you do good, I'll respect you. If not, tough, finish, go. All people's home. They, I have nothing. But Islam tells us, whether your parents are right or whether your parents are wrong, tough luck. Shut your mouth and do not raise your voice in front of them because you raise your voice in front of them. You, whether you displease them, whether you offend them or not, you will be offending Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. With which face do you take yourself into Salah when you have offended Allah by offending your parents? Then Allah will not forgive you until your parents are not happy with you.
So this is the base upon which I want to carry. This is how important this topic was. Don't just think it's just a collection of hadiths which uh, uh, my uh, predecessor uh, uh, expressed. This is a constituent part of it. Everything hinges on these things. If you take these things away, then there's nothing left. Adab is the basis of your belief, of your iman. And whereas you have different <coughs> adab for different people. Some people say to me, uh, I, I want to see a valiullah. <laughs> Can you just show me a valiyallah? I said, yeah, very easy. With a person's valaya, if I say this person is a vali, it's not definite that he's a vali, he could be a vali, he may not be a vali. But for a child, a valiyallah is their parents. <laughs> Why? Because Allah has given them buzurgi. Allah has given them status. Now for us, if a, vali, if a person behaves in a certain way, they are a valiyallah. But Allah says, listen, you must close your eyes. You mustn't look at what they do, who they are. For you, it is enough that they are your parents. Allah. And that biological superiority which they have over you, no matter who you are, whichever state of life you belong to, you will always be subservient to your parents in this dunya and in the akhirah. Allah. So with this base, now let's carry on. The verse of the Qur'an which I read, Allah says in the Qur'an, because people often say, okay, yes, we respect parents, okay, we do the work, but once they die, finish. <laughs> well, as the great saying goes, Marga mardud na fatiha na finish. Give up, God. That's it, that body is a piece of meat, just bury the body and that's it. Do the ritual of fasting and go, that's it, no. But the Ahl Sunnah and the Awliya Kiram have taught us that the Qur'an and Sunnah teach us that our relationship with the people of the grave is something that we must understand. And because we don't understand that relationship, therefore when our parents die, we think that's the end of our relationship with our parents. But actually, when they die, it's not the end of the relationship, it's the beginning of a new relationship. It's not the end of a relationship, it's the beginning of a new relationship. And that's what I want to just present, present a few thoughts on, and inshallah we'll uh, finish today. So what is this new relationship with the parents when they die? What is this new relationship with you? Firstly, to understand this, the, the verse of the Qur'an I've read, because nowadays in, in, uh, 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 in uh, 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 society you have people who say, no, once the person passes away, that's it, it's, it's, they're of no consequence. And uh, we should not really uh, allocate any attention towards them. But the verse of the Qur'an says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, O you, who you, o you who have been invested with the quality of Iman, La tatawallo qawman Just focus on this word, La tatawallo Don't make friends. Allah tells us who to make friends with. We make friends with people based on our aql. We make friends with people who we think will tomorrow be a source of uh, a need for us tomorrow. What is the saying? A friend in need is a friend? That's our criteria. Bishop, whoever he is, doesn't matter. As a, he's my friend. But Allah tells us who to become friends with. He says, now in this verse, La tatawallo qawman ghazib allahu alayhim Oh, people who have faith in your hearts, I'm talking to you. Allah says, don't make friends with those who Allah has punished. Ghazib Allahu alayhim. This isn't the uh, uh, ghazab of the hereafter, this is the ghazab in the dunya. Allah has been angry with them in the dunya. Don't make friends with those people. Why? They are disillusioned from the hereafter. This is a sign of those people. You know what? You want to know the sign of those people who Allah is angry with? Allah tells you a sign. He doesn't say on their forehead, Allah is angry with me. Do not make friends with me. That would be very easy. But Allah says, what is their sign? They are disillusioned in the hereafter. They say, what is the hereafter? Yeah, this is the life. Enjoy the life. This is the life. Let's make the most of this life. Allah says, this is the sign of people who Allah is angry with. Ghazib Allahu alayhim. This is the sign. And then Allah says, Kama, like those people, and don't become friends with these people, and don't become friends with those. 
But these people are like those people. Kama yaisal kuffaru min ashabil kubur. They are people. They are like those kafirs who are disillusioned with the people of the graves. So it means that to be disillusioned with the people of the graves is a sign of kufr. But to be orientated towards the people of the grave is a sign of iman. Ashab al qubur, the people of the grave, the Quran says. So our relationship with the people of the graves needs to be understood because as far as we are concerned, they are dead. And when someone is dead, can I ask you a question? What is the definition of death? What is the definition of death? If you look at Alama Zamakhshari, Alama Tabri, if you look at Tafsir Tabri, if you look at Ruhul Ma'ani, if you look at Fakhrul Razi, Alama Fakhrul Razi, all of them have written definitions of death. But if you look at death in its reality, what is death? Is death the extraction of the soul from the body? Is that death? When the soul leaves the body, is that death? I'm asking, is it death? Is that a fair understanding of death? When the soul leaves the body, is everyone happy with this definition? Yeah. Everyone, you're not responding. I need to know that you're here. Yes. Yeah. When the soul leaves the body, that's death? Yes. yes. Right. Well, I've got news for you. You're wrong. <laughs> because if the definition of death is when the ruh leaves the body, the Quran says every night when you go to sleep, your ruh leaves your body. So who said the person sleeping? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no? When a person is sleeping, the ruh is not in the body. But no one has said, totally cheeky, but you must get out of it. But if you ask the ulama, they will say there is no ruh in the body. So then what is the difference between a person who dies, there is no ruh in his body, and a person who is sleeping, there is no ruh. So then what is the definition of death? Now I'm not going to go into too much detail, otherwise I'll bore you. But all I'm saying to you is to define death as the soul leaving the body, this is very Mickey Mouse definition. Yeah, or Minnie Mouse, whichever you prefer, equal opportunity. <laughs> Every time you close your eyes and go to sleep, your roux leaves your body. But the difference of the soul leaving the body at sleep time and at death is that when the soul leaves the body when you go to sleep although the soul is not in the body the soul has the sudden of connection with the body it has a connection with the body and as long as that connection is there there is no there is no death there is no death. but the significance of death is that now that Ruh no longer has a connection with that body. Now, the Ruh no longer has connection with that body. You must understand this if you want to go one step further. The difference between sleep and death is that the soul has the sarraf over the... It has connection, control over the body even though it's not in the body. But at death, the connection is... The connection is finished. Finished. finished, but that finished connection is described in the Quran as kullu nafsin saikatu. Every no, uh, every nafs will taste death. There's a bottle of uh, coke here. I drink a glass. I taste the coke. What will happen after ten minutes? Will the taste still be there? If it's original. Not <laughs> will, the, <laughs> will the taste be there or gone? Taste by its definition, zayqa, is something that comes and? Goes. So Allah says, Kullu nafsin zayqa, every nafs will taste it. It's not every nafs will die. Every nafs will? 
Tasted. It means it will revert back to the same state it was in before. So death is a temporary phase. Death is a temporary phase. After that phase is over, you go back to life and now that life is a new life and a better life. What did I say? A new life and a? A new life and a? Better life. But when we look at the people of the graves, we say, better life? Look at them. Huh? This is a better life? Actually, their life isn't the same as our life. This is true. No one denies this. But if you look at the Quran and Sunnah, their life, their life is better than our life. When I say better, what do I mean better? Let me describe it. We're coming uh, 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 to trace the relationship between parents when they pass away. But we need to understand what their status is when they die. I often give this example. If I said to you, uh, can you see six feet beneath the floor? Can anyone see six feet beneath the floor? Let me tell you from Hadith, the Prophet said that when the people of the graveyard leave the graveyard, even the kafir in his grave, sitting in his grave, can hear the footsteps of people who are walking on the graveyard. So is Samaat, you are hearing, decreased when you go in your grave or is it increased? Increased. Huh? Increased. Decreased. You, we cannot hear what's going on beneath the floor, but those people who are beneath the floor can hear. And not only a moment, even a kafir can hear us. This is the samat of a, of a, samat of a kafir. The Prophet ﷺ, after the battle of Badr, he went to some of the uh, 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 kuffar who were, uh, uh, who were dead, and then he spoke to them. He spoke to them. He spoke to dead bodies. I mean, you speak to dead bodies, what will happen? No response. Wait, a free referral on the NHS to psychiatry? <laughs> <laughs> on the NHS. <laughs> I mean, he's talking to dead bodies. The Prophet ﷺ is speaking to the dead bodies of the kuffar and the mushrikeen. And said, Rahman. He looks at this and he said, Ya Rasulullah, are they hearing you? He said, Oh Omar, you do not hear them. You do not hear better than them. Your hearing is not better than them. When I'm speaking to them, the way you hear me, these dead people also hear me. This is a Sahih and this is Bukhari. So therefore, we realize that when we die, our hearing decreases or increases? Increases. Increases. Okay. Then uh, the Prophet wasallam said that when a person goes to the graveyard of his companion, of his someone whom he knows, that person shouldn't just go there. He shouldn't just... He shouldn't just go there and look at bricks and mortar. He should go there and Imam Tirmizi bring this hadith. He should say, Assalamu alaikum ya ahl al qubur. Ya? Some people say you shouldn't say Ya Rasulullah. Why? Because he's passed away. So here, Rasulullah is saying, say, Ya ahl al qubur. Oh, people of the graves. So to say to people of the graves, Ya is permissible, and to say to Rasulullah is not permissible. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. This is the matter of Imam Tirmizi Hadith. Assalamu alaikum. Ya ahl al qubur. Oh, people of the graves, salam upon you. Hadith in Bukhari and in, in, in uh, Muslim on this. Is that the Prophet sallallahu said that when uh, sorry not Imam Bukhari hasn't read this hadith 
this is by Imam Jalaluddin Suyuti in his Shara Sudur Fi Ahwal al Mawta wal Qubur. He says that when you go to the grave of your parents, the graves of your parents, parents and you say salam, they not only respond to your salam, but they tell the people in the next door grave, look, my son has come to visit me. <laughs> my grandson has come to visit me. They tell people, look, my Nishadar has come. We cannot see six feet beneath the floor, but the people of the grave can see six feet beneath the floor. They can see us on top of the floor. I ask you, is our vision better than theirs or is their vision better than ours? <laughs> Their vision is better than ours. So how dare we say that? What do you, Maryam, Allah finish? Their life is worse than ours. Their life is of a greater quality than ours. Let me give you another example. Uh, how many people here uh, speak fluent Arabic? Fluent Arabic. So if a speaker was invited by Molana Janah Usman Qureshi Sahib in Arabic, I think you'll get a lot of complaints. Because people will say, don't understand, get, get an interpreter. Huh? If you don't have an interpreter, then, then it'll just be, you know, for, it could be anything he could be saying to you. <laughs> be careful. There are those who in the name of Arabic say anything to you, if they don't really care. So, if you can't understand Arabic, you get an interpreter. But if you look at the hadith, a hadith on this point, all the muhaddisin have narrated this hadith. When I say all, I mean all the major muhaddisin have narrated this hadith. When you go in your grave, the angels will talk to you in Arabic and say, Man rabbuka, ma dinuka, ma kunta They will talk to you in Arabic. You won't say that. I don't know what he's talking about. You will understand him. You will understand the angels and you will respond to the angels. I ask you, where did you get the knowledge of Arabic from? You can speak Arabic in your life, no matter how many crash courses you do. But if you can't speak a language, how can you understand and have a conversation? But in your grave, a conversation will take place in Arabic. And there you will understand Arabic and you will respond in Arabic. In Arabic. So does your knowledge decrease when you go in your grave or does it increase? Increase. Now the question, this is another question, how? Did you get that extra knowledge? Who, who taught you Arabic? Was there Arabic tuition classes as soon as you went in your grave? No. The, this is a separate question. How you obtained that knowledge? This is a separate topic. But all I want to say is your knowledge doesn't decrease when you go in your grave. In, in fact, uh, the Prophet ﷺ was talking uh, one day amongst his companions and uh, uh, I was talking about the grave and the angels of death in the, and Sayyidina Umar radiallahu and said, Ya Rasulullah, will my akal be uh, a time in my grave? Will my intellect be time in my grave? He said, yes. He said, then I will deal with the angels in the grave. SubhanAllah. <laughs> <laughs> I will deal with the angels. <laughs> How dare anyone say, I will deal with the angels, but this is Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu and he, he knows he knows if shaitan runs from his shadow, then you think the angels of death are a, are a difficult task for him? Yeah. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is our knowledge doesn't decrease, it increases. increases. You know, there used to be a, 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 a cleaner, one, one side, he, he, he used to be in Hijaz, his name was Tara Singh. When you go to him, he said, Tara Sahib, oh, what do you believe in? He said, I believe in Allah. <laughs> Tara Singh, he believes in Allah. <laughs> so when he would go to Hindus, he would say, who do you believe? He said, I believe in Bhagawan. Ganga ke, Ganga Ram, Jamna ke, Jamna Das. So he would say, wherever he would come in front of Muslims, he would say, I, I'm, a, I'm a Muslim. But when you go in your grave, you can't have diplomacy there. Ah. This, the Tarasin culture will not apply there. Why? Because although you will realize what the truth is, but you will only be able to talk the truth. You will only be able to talk the truth. There your aql will not allow you to be cunning. There you will only tell the truth. And if you believe in Allah, you will respond. I said to you, here, here's a book. 
I go up to a village, a village person and say, Yeh, yeh, kitab pura, he says, I can't read. What language? I can't read. I can't read at all. I'm bilkul jahil kawar. I can't read. I've never learned. I've never been to school. But the Quran says, on the day of judgment, when a person appears in a maidan, the angels will come to him and give him a book. And they will say, Iqra, kitab, read your book. If a person who is illiterate, someone comes to him and says, here's your book, read it. He will say, I can't read. But on the day of judgment, no matter how illiterate he was there, he will be given a book and he will read his book. The question is, where did that knowledge come from? This is a separate question. But the answer is, does your knowledge decrease when you go in, into the grave or does it increase? It, is. it increases. So we can conclude that our life in the grave, the grave, the life of the grave isn't the same as this life, it is better. It is better than this life. Now as far as our parents are concerned, when we uh, 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 remember them, there's two things. Praising them, that's one thing. And the other thing is, as sending Isa al sawab for them. I'm sure you've heard this hadith. The Prophet what is the answer hadith from that? The Prophet said a person's link with this dunya finishes except for three. Illa salas, except for three. Number one, uh, you know that he's telling you. Come on, you know that he's telling you. Sadka Jaliya. People are now getting worried because this hadith is normally you do. Chanda Kacha Kadla Ura. People say, Chanda Diyo Ku Sadka Jaliya Kuroji. No. Sadka Jaliya, you do it, you, you get reward for it. And then, Ilmun Nafi'un. Knowledge which is beneficial. If you leave that knowledge, if you give that knowledge, yeah. <laughs> if you give that knowledge, as long as that knowledge is practiced, you will get benefit from it. And the third part of the hadith is, waladun salihun. Waladun And the uh, mafhum of this uh, Arabic is, Waladun salihun aulad ho lekin wabino. Why? Because salihun yaghfirlah. The words that they say yaghfirlah. Aulad bhi ho saleh bhi ho lekin uske liye maghfirat bhi kare. It all, he also, they do maghfirah. And according to Mahabhi, you can't do maghfirah. So the Prophet said, Aulad ho lekin wabino. The Prophet said, Aulad ho lekin wabino. So, being silent in its own right is good. Your parents will have commission. Whatever good deed you do. That is why, when you, in your salah, in your tashahud, you say, Rabbana fil li wali wali diya. They're dead. How can they receive any benefit? No. Even in their graves, whatever good deed you do, they will continue to receive a commission of your deeds oh. in their graves. That's one thing. And the other thing is praising them. Yeah, okay. Only whilst they're there, praise them. You? If you praise someone, they become happy, isn't it? You praise them when they're living. They go, Shabash, well then. <laughs> You know, you look at your old mother, you say, how beautiful are you? Look at, uh, look at you, you're the most beautiful woman in the world. You, you praise her. Mother becomes happy. But when they pass away, you praise your parents. Mother becomes happy or not happy, Allah becomes happy. <laughs> that is why Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, uh, uh, he brings this, uh, Imam Tirmidhi narrates this hadith, but this hadith is in Bukhari and uh, Muslim and other Aima uh, uh, Muhaddisi have brought this hadith, where the Prophet sallallahu said that when he saw a janazah, when he saw a janazah and people were praising the person who had passed away, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Wajabat, Wajabat, Wajabat. <laughs> the companions heard, Wajabat, Wajib ho gaya, Wajib ho gaya, Wajib ho gaya. What? They didn't question him. A few days later, another janazah passed away. 
And the Prophet ﷺ saw that some people were surrounded and he heard the conversation. And he said, Wajabat, Wajabat, Wajabat. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu was sitting, uh, uh, sitting next to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, Ma Wajabat ya Rasulullah. What is this Wajabat, Wajabat? And three is for taqi, you know, like you do wuzu. Three times. This is for taqi. <laughs> Only if taqi. Uh, 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 uh. Otherwise, your farziyat could be fulfilled. On the first go, when you wash yourself, but for taqi, for emphasis. So, if the, in case there is any scope for doubt, you do it twice. And then the Sharia says, in case there is any further scope for doubt, you do it three times. The Prophet said, Wajaba, 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 Wajib Hua, Wajib Hua, Wajib Hua. If a Mufti Sahib said to you, Wajib Hua, Wajib Hua, Wajib Hua, you will say, Kya Wajib Hua? Konsa Hukam Wajib Hua? Why? Because we are mukallif. We need to say, how does that hukam become wajib for us? He will show you, this is Quran and Sunnah. According to this verse, it is wajib upon you to do this. According to this dalil, it is wajib for you to do this. The Prophet said, wajabat, wajabat, wajabat. And said, no more said, radiallahu said, ma wajabat. He said, what, what, what is wajib? He said, because the people in the first janaza, they were <coughs> praising the mayyat. They were praising him. And on account of that praise, Antum man athnaytum bil khair, man athnaytum bil khairi, wajabat lahul jannah. Why? Because Antum shuhada Allah fil, uh, uh, fil al. You are the witnesses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the mu'mineen praise the mayyad, the person who's passed away, it is wajib upon Allah. It is wajib upon Oh. It is wajib upon Allah. Look at this statement. It is wajib upon oh. Allah that He will grant him Jannah. Why? Because Mu'mineen have given testimony. So when Mu'mineen give testimony, Allah accepts that testimony. And on account of that acceptance, Allah gives them Jannah. Oh. So by talking about your parents, their virtues, their good deeds, they will become happy in their grave and Allah will become happy. And when Allah accepts your testimony, on account of that testimony, Allah will give them salvation in the Qabr and in the Ashes. So it's simply talking about them. This idea of talking good. Uh, that hadith, by the way, is, is uh, uh, next to it. It's, it's in Babul Jalais. The Prophet when he uh, uh, saw uh, the Mayyat, he stood up. He stood up. What did he do? Stood up. Some people say he. Uh, he's standing up. What is this posture? They say this is respect. Why should you respect someone like this? No. The Prophet showed us, told us that and this is also in Bukhari, these words are when any one of you sees a janaza, you should stand up. Subhanallah. Now, according to Imam Abu Hanifa, according to uh, 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 the Ahnaf, this uh, Amal is mansuh. But why did he, why did he s tell his companions to stand up? One shara of this hadith by Ibn Hajar Asqalani is that he told them to stand up not only for the respect of the mayyat, but because of the angels that come with the mayyat. There are angels to stand up for them. That is why you know when the Mu and Mubarak came into this room, what did we do? We stood up. Why? Because if an ordinary mayyat comes, we stand up for the mayyat. Here, we are not standing up for a dead hair. We are standing up for the living hair of the living prophet. Nara Risalat! Ya Rasulullah! Nara Hadri! Ya Islam! So every hair of the Prophet is living. Every hair is living. Death does not fall upon an ordinary person in his grave. How can it befall upon? How can it dominate the grave of Rasulullah? The conclusion of my lecture is this. Our relationships with our parents are not limited to this dunya. Why? Because when they are in their graves, when they are in their graves, 
they continue to receive benefit from us and we continue to receive benefit from them they continue to receive benefit from them uh, from us and we continue to receive benefit from them why because the way they could do dua for us then when they were living they can continue to do dua when they are in their graves why should i give you an example of this how they can continue to do dua in their graves <laughs> whoever they are wherever they are as long as they're mu'mineen they can do dua for us. Why? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The hadith I, I told you. He said, when you go past the graveyard, you should say assalamu alaikum, ya al qubur. And what happens when they hear your salam? They they say wa alaikum assalam. Tell me, salam is dua. Salam is dua. We give them dua, they give us dua. So if they can give dua to us by salam, imagine what they can do for us in their graves. Why? Because their dua is a source of benefit for us in this dunya. And the caliber of that dua is on the night of Miraj, the Prophet ﷺ went up and he saw on the seventh heaven, he was told that there are two duas that reach the seventh heaven without the aid of any angel. There are two duas that reach the seventh heaven without the assistance of any angel. Because normally when you do, do dua, angels come and take that dua up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are two duas that do not require the assistance of angels. They go straight up to the seventh heaven. Which two duas are those? The first is the dua of the Muslim. The dua of the? Muslim. Dua of the? Muslim. You know what a Muslim is? Someone who is oppressed. Someone who is oppressed. Someone who is oppressed, his dua is a, is a source of, uh, 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 has a, a lot of uh, uh, acceptability in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's barga. And the second dua is the dua of the parents for their child. Allah. It goes unaided into the barga of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that dua and that process of dua doesn't, is not limited to their life. It continues even after their life. And our relationship with them is not limited to when their body was in their soul. Even their mayyad receives us, even their mayyad when they are dead in front of us, they know who we are. Our handling of them gives them contentment, gives them uh, 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 sukoon. Why? The Prophet sallallahu he there was a companion of his, Sayyidina Usman bin uh, Maz'oon radiallahu an, and he passed away, the Prophet sallallahu came and he kissed his body. He kissed it and he would passed away. So it means that kissing uh, uh, the body of someone. Why? Because although the rule doesn't have control for a temporary purpose, for a temporary purpose, for temporary purposes, the rule doesn't have control. But as soon as, as soon as the taste of death is gone, and as soon as the person is put back into his uh, uh, into his cupboard, the rule comes back and has control over the body once again. That is why the questioning then takes place and then, of course, then it carries on from there. But the parents, they continue to look at their children in the dunya and even in their graves. So when someone passes away, they ask that person, how is my son? How is my daughter? How is my grandson? What are they doing at the moment? What are they doing? What is their activity? They are interested in your lives in their graves. But we are not interested in their lives because as far as we concern, finished, gone, that's it, end of my duty. No, they still have rights over you that you remember them. You send Isa al sawab for them. You continue to uh, send blessings for them. They will have automatic commission from your uh, worship anyway. But if you allocate specifically, Ya Allah send the sawab of this to them, that has a greater source of uh, 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 benefit for them uh, and I'll finish with a, it's a semi joker my uh, uh, uncle he's still alive so uh, you know they say Rog Bargardine Ravi in the Ravi it's on the Ravi but my uh, uncle he's still alive Muraz Islam has one of the Tawab Siddiqui Zina Majdu he said one day he, he every after every Salah he used to send uh, Isan al Sawab for his grandparents so uh, my great grandfather so he said one day after he would do dua, he said, Ya Allah, send the, 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 the,
Swami. No one was wise. So one day his grandfather came in his, into his dream. My great grandfather, Hazrat Muhammad Hafiz Muhammad Amin Sahib, Alhamdulillah, he came into his dream. He said, "Beta, I am very happy. I am very happy you sent Isa al Swab for me. But one thing is wrong. He said, for my sake, he said, when you sent Isa al Swab, send for her separately and for me separately. It's very happy that she she finds it at home. Of course, they're not." <laughs> Who said you can have domestic in your grave? <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's. Uh, the Bushir Hafi was walking one day in the graveyard and he saw the people of the grave, they were fighting with each other. He said, What's happened? Why are you fighting? He said, We're not fighting, guy not fighting. He said, Do you blow me? He, 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 he got one of the persons of the grave. He said, Why are you fighting with each other? He, he, he took him away. He said, We're not fighting. And they carried on fighting. Third time he asked him, Jalal, he said, Why are you fighting? I command you. Why are you fighting? He said, oh, just a few months ago, there was a person called Hasnib Basri. Oh. He passed his graveyard. He was in a hurry. And he said, he read one time Surah Fatiha and three times Surah Ikhlas. He said, oh Allah, I haven't got time to allocate it specifically for the people. Send the salam of this to all the people of the grave. He said, one week has passed away. We're fighting over who gets the most salam. <laughs> So it means Isa al-Sawab is not something that is just uh, generic. If you give it specifically for your parents, it has specific benefits for them. And that is why the Ahlul Sunnah continue that relationship with their parents in the dunya, in the qabr, and in the hill. Subhanallah Walhamdulillah